Good morning, guys. It's Pastor Andy, and I'm excited to open God's Word with you this morning on this Sunday morning and share with you what God's put on my heart. And I think it's going to be a help to a lot of people. So as we get started this morning, what I'd like for you to do to begin with is to hit the like and the share button so that we can get God's Word out to as many people as we can possibly do this morning. We finished our series up on Elijah last week, and we're starting a new series this morning, and it's called Basic Training. We're going to get back to the basics of Christianity, and I'm really, really excited about this because what an awesome opportunity we have as we're talking about the basics of Christianity to get the word out to people who may be either far from God or may not have a relationship with Him at all. So we want to do our best to get God's Word out to as many people as we possibly can. But as our custom is, before we start the service, we always share some things that we can celebrate about. Now, I know I'm in this auditorium and it's completely empty, and I'm going to share some things, and I'm going to expect you to be excited about it at home. I'm excited about it here. But here we go. Last Sunday, even with doing most of our content on live stream, most of our service live streamed, we still had several hundred people in the building and several guests. And we had one adult who trusted Christ in the morning service, even in the midst of all these things that are going on. That's exciting. We also had two sign up to be baptized, which is awesome. We had two more turn in their membership paperwork. So it is exciting to see that even in the midst of this difficult, trying time, God is still doing a work here at Open Door. And I want you to be excited about it because I'm thrilled. I mean, I'm about to explode. I'm so excited. So I wanted to share that with you this morning as we get started. And you can celebrate a little bit at home and and spend some time today singing, uh, get some worship music on in the house and sing and, and just rejoice and praise the Lord together as a family. We're going to talk about God's Word this morning. In God's Word, we're going to share some things about this basics of Christianity. And the thing that we're going to be discussing this morning is what does the Bible say about salvation? Now, sometimes you just have to get back to the basics of things. I know, especially in sports, I played sports all my life and love Love, love, love basketball. And there's a famous coach, John Wooden, who was a longtime uh, basketball coach at UCLA uh, from 1948 to 1975, and he was called the Wizard of Westwood. And if you know anything about basketball, especially college basketball, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. This man won 10 national championships in 12 years, and that includes seven of them in a row. That's never been done before. The closest ever to that was four in a row. John Wooden coached some unbelievable players. Some of them would include the likes of Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But John Wooden would start every basketball season by standing all his guys up and he would look at them all holding a basketball in his hand and this is what he would say, gentlemen, this is a basketball. And the great John Wooden, who was coaching some of the best athletes, some of the best basketball players in the country, would start off with something as basic as looking at his guys and saying, guys, this is a basketball. He knew that that was the best way to start off, by going back to the basics. And if we're going to get back to the basics, we're going to need some basic training, so to speak. We need to start at the beginning. And the beginning of the Christian life is the relationship that we have with Jesus. So what does the Bible say about being saved? Well, there's some verses of Scripture I want to share with you this morning. We're going to start in Acts chapter 4, verse number 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man who you crucified, it, but, God, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Here's the key verse, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The only name, the only way 
to have salvation is through Jesus Christ. That word saved or save is used over 300 times in the Bible. Some of the most famous is verses like Romans chapter 10 that says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. We really need to understand what salvation is. Is it really something that we truly do understand as a Christian, as a believer, as someone who attends church every Sunday, or as someone who grew up in a Christian nation, as they say America is? But uh, we really got to understand it. I heard a preacher say one time, you will never do much for God until you realize how much he has done for you. And that's so true. We need to understand what Jesus Christ did for us so that we can know what happened to us. Salvation is the central theme in all of the God's word. The, the whole Bible is all about salvation. But first we need to understand, sal before we understand salvation, we need to understand, make sure we understand some very uh, confusing words that are used at times, some misunderstood words in the Bible and what they actually mean. The first one I want us to look at is that word saved. The word saved means salvaged, forgiven, or spared. And if we're going to be saved, we've know, we need to know what we're being saved from. What are we being salvaged from? What are we being forgiven from? What are we being spared from? Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What we're saved from is the penalty of our sin, which is death. It says there in the verse that we just read, the wages of sin is death. The penalty, that word wages means penalty. So we are saved from the penalty of our sins. And the penalty of our sins is death. And that's not just talking about a physical death here. It's talking about a spiritual death as well. You might say, well, Pastor Andy, I, I didn't know that there was more than one kind of death. I, I didn't know that there was a second kind. I thought there was just death and, and you know, when we die. But there are actually two different deaths that are talked about in the Bible. The second death that's talked about is in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. The Bible says, But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The second death that's talked about here is the death of the spirit. It's a spiritual death. And when we die physically, this second death takes place. And we'll either spend eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven and not have to pay the penalty of our sins, not have to face the second death, or we will face the second death if we have rejected the free gift of salvation that Christ offers to us. And at that case, we'll spend eternity in a terrible place called hell. That second death is separation from God in that place. And there's a lot of us who should end up there because we've sinned and broken God's law. But not just a lot of us, all of us. You might say, well, I've never really killed anybody or never stolen anything or never done anything really bad. But the Bible says that we've all sinned. Every single one of us have broken God's law. Romans 3.23 says, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. God's glorious standard is perfection, and none of us have reached that. We might like to think that we have or, or hope that one day we could achieve perfection, but we've all sinned. James chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For the person who keeps all of the law except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's law. So even if we break one of God's law, the Bible says that we're guilty of breaking all of them. So even if you've only ever broken one in your whole life, you're still guilty of breaking all of them. Do you know what one of God's laws is? This is a tough one. And it's one that every single one of us can relate to. Thou shalt not lie. Have you ever told a lie? I wish I could say I'd never told a lie. But every single one of us have, at some time in our life, we have told a lie. And if that's the only one law that there was, we'd all be in trouble because every single one of us have told a lie at some point in our life. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, God saved you 
by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Even though we have sinned and broken God's law, we've broken God's standard of righteousness, and we understand that there is a penalty to pay for it, we can't live enough a good enough life, we can't give enough money, we can't behave enough or help enough to pay that penalty on our own because we are imperfect people and we have all sinned. And salvation is, has nothing to do with me. As I said, salvation is not a reward for the good deeds we've done. It says salvation is a gift from God. And we saw that in a verse earlier, Romans 6, 23, that says the wages of sin is death, the penalty, remember, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So what is it to be saved? What am I being saved from? What am I being salvaged from or spared from? Well, when I come to a relationship with Jesus and I meet him and I become one of his kids, I become a Christian, I am being saved from eternal punishment. That's separation from God in a terrible place called hell. That's what it means to be saved. There's another word that's really misunderstood in the Bible, and it's the word conviction. And the word conviction means to convince of sin. Have you ever been convinced that you were a sinner? Maybe you just were while we were talking about lying. But we've all sinned. John chapter 16 says, But now I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. As a person, I have to know that I am a sinner and that I am in need of a Savior before I can be saved. And here, the Holy Spirit is the one who works in our life, who convicts us of sin, who tells us that we have done wrong. It doesn't matter who you are. If we're honest with ourselves, we'd all have to admit every single one of us have sinned. We've all done wrong. And that's what we need to understand. We need to be convicted of that. We need to understand it in our heart so that we can take the next step. Another word that's confusing or misunderstood in the Bible is the word repent. And the word repent means to change one's mind, purpose, or direction. It means to turn around. And there's a lot of people in a lot of churches who try to twist repentance into some kind of a salvation that we have to work for or something that we have to do in order to earn salvation. They teach that you have to clean up your life in order to come to Jesus. But unfortunately, that's not taught anywhere in the Bible. I was listening to a preacher this week who was, uh, grew up much like I did in a very conservative home and went to a church where we had to wear certain things and do certain things. And, and he said, you know, he had decided when he was a young man, if God ever let him lead a church, and they, he had to be the one who decided the dress code for the church, what his decision was is yes have one. <laughs> wear dress, wear clothes. <laughs> we weren't going to get stuck on what people are wearing. We want people to come to Jesus first because we don't have to clean our life up in order to come to Jesus. When we come to Jesus, he begins to clean our life up from the inside out. He makes the changes in our life. He cleans us up and he, because he loves us and because he cares about us and because he wants us to be the kind of person that we should be, what a real Christian is. So we allow him into our life at salvation. He comes in and he begins to change us from the inside out. Instead of like what most churches and most religions try to do, change you from the outside in. You have to look this way. You have to act this way. You have to talk this way. You have to use these kind of words. You have to listen to this kind of music. You have to have your hair I'd be in trouble a certain way, but all those kind of things. But that's not true Christianity. True Christianity is me coming to Christ just like I am, and he accepts me just like I am, and he begins to change me from the inside out. Another word that's commonly misunderstood in the Bible is the word believe, and believe means to trust. Acts chapter 16 says, Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening. The, the great missionary Paul, the Apostle Paul, and his partner during this time, Silas, were out preaching, and they were thrown into prison. So here they are praying and singing hymns to God in prison. Verse 26 says, Suddenly 
there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. He was going to go ahead and take his own life because that would have been the consequence of him letting prisoners go. The verse go, Bible goes on in verse 28. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself! We are all here! The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31 says, They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. What they're saying is here, if you will believe the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. If you will put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you, you will be saved. And not just you. If your household will do it, they will be saved too. That doesn't just mean acknowledging that you believe in something. It means I have to put my full trust in Jesus as my Savior and believe that he will do what he promised to do, and that is to save me. Another word that's misunderstood in the Bible is the word grace, and it means unearned or unmerited favor. Ephesians 2 verse 8 through 10 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this, for it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. We read those verses a few moments ago, but the next verse, verse 10, is just as powerful. It says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. We are God's masterpiece. He loves us. He cares about us. And why, why does God choose to save sinners like you and me? I mean, if, if we are really a mess, if we are really that bad, why does God care about me? Well, grace. He's giving me something that I do not deserve. My dad used to say grace. If you made it an acrostic, it means God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's exactly what grace is. It's God giving me something that I do not deserve that his only son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to pay for my sins, gives and offers freely to me. Another word that's misunderstood in the Bible is faith. Uh, and the definition of faith is trusting God's promise enough to claim them and put them to the test. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. See, I have to not just believe in God, I have to act on that belief. There are basically three parts to faith. One is a knowledge. Knowledge means that I know how to be saved. I know what I need to do. I need to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did. Um, believe in him. Then there is that belief part, which means we have to believe what the Bible says. And then there's the trust, which is putting that all into action. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth, that the Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. It goes back to an old story in the, in the Old Testament where the children of Israel had been uh, being judged by God, and God brought up these fiery serpents, these snakes that when they bit, it felt like your skin was on fire. It was a poisonous snake that would kill you. And right there, I'm out wherever they were. I don't ever want to go because I don't like snakes. Big snakes, small snakes, poisonous snakes. All snakes are poisonous, so all snakes. Uh, doesn't matter. Rubber snakes, fake snakes, all snakes, bad snakes. Don't like snakes. So <laughs> here they are, poisonous snakes who are coming up in the desert where they are, biting the children of Israel, these Israelites, these Jewish people. And they were dying left and right. And then God told Moses to wrap a bronze serpent, a snake, on a pole and lift it up for everyone to see it. And he told them when they would look at that, they would live. So that was a picture of Jesus. Bronze in the Bible is a, it has a picture, and Jesus pictures this whole thing of being lifted up. And when we look to him, because he took all our sin on us, and he, because he cares about us, he took every sin I would ever commit all the ones that I had committed before I became a Christian, all the sins I commit after I'm a Christian. It takes all the sins of not just me, but every person in the whole world. 
and he became them. He took them on himself, and he was lifted up on that cross for all the world to see. And that's what the picture is here, is this serpent was lifted up on the pole, and they had to look to it to be saved. And Jesus did that same thing for us. When we look to him for salvation, we can be saved. When we put our trust and our faith in him. So what is it to put your faith in something? Well, it kind of reminds me of the old guy who used to walk the high wire or across the Grand Canyon. Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon and, and seen somebody do this? It, it's crazy. I've never been there to see it, but I've seen it on TV. And this guy was walking across this tightrope across the Grand Canyon. And he had a wheelbarrow in front of him. So he's pushing this wheelbarrow, and then he puts a blindfold on and goes all the way across on this tightrope with a wheelbarrow in front and a blindfold around his eyes. And he gets all the way over, and he looks over into the crowd, and there's this big dude standing there. And he looks, takes the blindfold off, looks at this dude and says, hey, do you believe that I can do this again? And the big dude looked at him and says, well, I just saw you do it, so yeah, I believe you could do it again. And then the tightrope walker looked at him and says, okay, get in the wheelbarrow. You see, I can believe that somebody can do it, but putting my faith in something is me getting in to the wheelbarrow. And that takes a lot of faith. And that's, that's why we're looking at this Christianity thing today is we want to see what it really means to be a Christian. How do I become a Christian? We've got to be so familiar with what it is that we can spot what it's not. Kind of like what our U.S. Secret Service does, the Treasury Department. They, when they train these men to spot counterfeits, they don't give them a lot of counterfeits to look at. They give them the real thing to look at. So they become so familiar with the touch, the feel, the look of real currency that when they see something that doesn't match, they know it immediately. And that's the way we should be with God's Word and with Christianity. We should know exactly what the Bible says so that we hear something or see something that is not true. We can identi uh, identify it immediately and know that it is not true. Because you can basically roll all of the religions of the world up into two categories. One is works. That means I have to do something. And the other is Christ, which means he already did it for me. And that's what we believe, and that's what the Bible teaches, is that Jesus Christ already paid the penalty for our sins. When he was on the cross, he looked down and said, it is finished. He wasn't talking about his life. He was talking about the work of salvation, what he had to do to pay the wages of our sin, the penalty for our sins. It's Jesus alone, plus or minus nothing. It's all about him. He did it all, and he did it for you, and he did it for me because he loves us and because he cares about us. And when we come to him for salvation, something amazing happens in our life. We, to use a Bible word, we become justified. And that word justified means to be made just as like I was never even a sinner. That means I'm made just like the only one who had never been a sinner. Do you know who that was? The only person who ever lived a perfect life, who never sinned, was Jesus Christ himself. And when God looks down and he sees me, he sees Andy Schelling, he sees the account of Jesus Christ. He sees a clean record. He sees a clean slate. And that only happens because Jesus paid the penalty for my sins on that cross. He died for me. He paid the penalty for my sins, and he did it for you as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. On that cross, Jesus took our sin, our sin record on himself. And the moment I come to Christ, I no longer have my own record because he has taken it on him and he gives me his. So my old record is gone forever. Those sins that I committed, they're gone. The Bible says they're separated as far as the east is from the west. There is no way to measure that. They are completely gone. Now, does that mean I'm never going to sin again? Does that mean I'm going to live a perfect life now that I'm a Christian? Well, I wish that's what it meant, but absolutely not. So then what happens when I, as a Christian, sin? When I'm a believer, when I come to Christ for salvation, the Bible calls it being born again. And when you're born, you have a father and a mother. Every single person who's ever been born has those two things. It takes two people to bring us into this earth. And when we come into Christ's family, when we are born again, we have a heavenly Father. That's God who loves and cares about us. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever done anything to make your dad upset at you? 
If you're anything like me, you don't have to think very long. You know the answer, and the answer is um, absolutely. Uh, yes, I have. Well, of course, because we're kids and we do things and we, we get in trouble and we mess up and those kind of things. But now, when I did that and made my dad mad, when I did wrong, did I have to come back to my dad and say, Dad, I'm so sorry. Would you please forgive me? And would you become my dad again? Well, that's stupid because he's our dad. He's always going to be our dad. We have a blood relationship. I'm his child. And the same is true with our Heavenly Father. When we sin, we don't have to come to him asking him to become our dad again. We just have to simply come and make things right, just like we would with our parents. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, But if we, this is talking to people who have come to Jesus, who are Christians, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. That means when I mess up and when I sin, I have to come back to my heavenly father. I have to come back to God and I have to tell him that I'm sorry. I have to make it right with him. I confess my sins to him and the Bible says he will forgive me. So when I come to Christ for salvation, I become a Christian. So can I ever lose that? Is that something that can disappear one day? Do I have to do it again? Well, John chapter 10 kind of answers that for us. John chapter 10 verse 28 says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. That means when I come to him and become his child, I am put in his hand. And the Bible here says, no one can get me out. That means I can't get myself out. You can't get me out. No one can get me out. Once I'm there, I am secure. I am safe. Remember, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is just that, eternal. That means there is no ending. He can't take it back and he, because eternity never ends. So if eternity never ends, our salvation never ends. Now, if I behave badly in my life, my eternity, my salvation isn't in jeopardy. But it, it, because it doesn't change my salvation, it doesn't change eternity. Eternal life is eternal. But it does change how I'm received when I get to heaven. It's kind of like a story that I heard about two guys on an airplane. One of them got on and he was the most kind-hearted, gentle, respectful man. And the stewardess walked him in, the flight attendant walked him in, he sits down in his seat, thanks her. And then somebody else comes in and is just berating the flight attendant, was an absolute jerk, tore up the seats, messed with the, the, the smoke detector, was yelling at other customers uh, on the flight. I mean, he was just a mess. Now, are both of those guys going to end up at the same destination? Yes. Both will end up wherever that airplane takes them, but their reception when they get there is going to be very different. One of them is going to walk out with a smile on his face. The other is going to walk out in handcuffs. <laughs> so once you're saved, once we become a Christian, that lasts forever. But our reception when we get to heaven is determined by our trip. As we go through life, there are different stages that we go through in Christianity. There is, there's, there's one that happens at salvation. There's one that should be happening now. And there's one that should happen in the future. The first one that happened at salvation is a word called justification. We talked about that already. And this happens at salvation. This means that we're made as if we had never been a sinner. We're given the record of Jesus Christ. We're given a clean slate. That's not a gradual process. It happens all at once, immediately at salvation. This stops the penalty of sin, death, and hell. It happens when we are saved, justification. The second one that should be happening now is sanctification. Sanctification is growing in your Christian life. It means that you are set apart for service. Now this one is a process. This is something that all of us will be going through until we get to heaven. This is the process of God making us more and more like his son, Jesus, and less like the rest of the world around us. Sanctification is all about our daily living. Are we growing? Are we becoming more like Jesus? Romans chapter 12 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Become, uh, because of all he has done for you, 
Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We are to allow God to transform us. Transform is the same word we get our word metamorphosis from, a changing. And when we become a Christian, our life should experience a metamorphosis. It should change drastically. It should be very, very different than it was before we became a Christian. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says, This means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. So sanctification is a process that happens after salvation where we become more like Jesus. We don't become sinless, but we do sin less than we did before. So sanctification. The third one is glorification. And this is when we get a new body, when Jesus comes back. And this is going to be awesome because this stage affects our body drastically. This is a definite act where we receive a perfect body and we're never going to have to worry about sin again. Man, I cannot wait until that day when I don't have to worry about sin. I'm going to have a new glorified body. It's going to be awesome. The aches and pains, no more. The crying and tears, no more. We're going to be with Christ at this time. It's going to be awesome. Glorification. Big word. Salvation, I heard, is kind of like an old tin can that was on the side of the road. A man was walking and found that can and picked it up and put it in his bag, a picture of justification. Then he brought that can to a recycling plant and it was crushed and reformed, a picture of sanctification. And then it comes out on the other end as a brand new car and that's glorification. So as a Christian, as a believer, we go through these three stages in our life. I can tell you, I'm so glad that one day Jesus looked down and saw me. And I wasn't any better than an old tin can. I was a mess. I was a sinner. I was far from God. I had no hope of salvation. But he looked down and he saw me. And he cared enough about me to have someone show me how I could have a relationship with him. I know we've talked a lot about what salvation is here in the last little bit. But to sum it all up, if you've never come into a relationship with Jesus, you've never taken that step of salvation, you're not sure that you could have heaven as your home one day. You can know that. And the Bible's very clear. First thing we under, need to understand is that we're all sinners. We talked about that. We've all broken God's standard of righteousness. We've all sinned. We have to understand there's a penalty for that sin. Because we sin, the penalty for that is separation from God in a terrible place called hell. But the good news is, is that Jesus loved us so much that he came and lived on this earth a perfect life, died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and then three days later rose from the grave. And all we have to do is put our faith and trust in him to take us to heaven. The Bible says, for whosoever, that's anybody, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And you can do that right where you're at this morning. You can pray and you can come into a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to be here at this church. You don't have to walk up on that stage. You don't have to grab a microphone. You don't have to, you know, stand in front of Walmart with a huge sign. Nothing like that. You have to pray and ask God for that free gift of salvation. And you don't even have to do it out loud because God hears the prayer of our heart. So if you've never done that before, but you would like to do it now, you would like to accept that free gift of salvation, would you just pray with me right where you are? In your own heart, you don't even have to pray out loud. If you're by yourself and you'd like to pray out loud, that's great too. But God will hear the prayer of our hearts. So if you'd like to accept that free gift of salvation, would you just pray with me right now? Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I deserve to go to hell because of my sin. But thank you for dying on a cross and paying the penalty for my sin. And the best way I know how, I accept your free gift of salvation. Please come into my heart and take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, that's the most important decision you can ever make in your life. 
I would never embarrass you. I would never show up at your door banging on it or bombard you with letters in the mail. But I would like to pray for you. And I'm, my email address is on the screen right now. Would you just shoot me an email today and say, Hey, Pastor Andy, I just wanted you to know that I prayed with you today. And I'm going to use that email as a prayer list. And I'm going to pray for you every day this week that God would help you in your Christian life, that God will take care of you with the scares that are going on right now with this virus that is out, then this outbreak. So I want you to email me. Pastor Andy, I prayed with you today, and I'm going to rejoice with you about that, and I'm going to pray for you every day. Christian, if you have any prayer requests, please email this email address as well. And I'll be happy to pray for those prayer requests this week. I know we don't have a bulletin thing to turn in so that you can uh, drop that in the offering plate or anything like that. But would you just email me? And I will promise you that I will pray for the request that you email me every single day this, uh, every single day this week. If you prayed and trusted Christ and you email me, I'm going to be so excited for you. The next step after trusting Christ as your Savior is believer's baptism. And that's not something that takes you to heaven. It just identifies you with other believers. That's the next step. If you'd like to take that step, email me and let me know. We'll be talking about baptism next week. We also have a food pantry here at our church where we have some supplies, and we want to be able to help you if you're in need. So if you need anything, please email me and let me know. If you have extra and would like to donate that, please let me know. You can bring it by the church at any time and drop it off. You don't even have to have contact with anybody. Just pull up underneath the carport, unload it, and drive away. And I promise you I'll get it, and I'll get it taken care of for you. We want to be able to not just come to church, but we want to actually be the church, especially during this, this trying time in our world. We also have Right Now Media available for you. We'd love for you to log into that and watch some of those Bible studies and get your kids involved in it. There's over 20,000 video resources available for you for anything that you can imagine. I mean, if you're struggling with addiction at 2 o'clock in the morning and you need help, there's help for you there. If you're struggling with your kids, there's help for you there. If you're struggling in your marriage, there's help for you there. This is an awesome resource for you. I want you to log into it. And if you did not get the invite for that emailed to you, again, email me at that email address on the screen and I will send you the invite so you can get uh, logged in and you can take care of that. We're also streaming today, not just on Facebook Live, but also on YouTube Live. We're streaming on our app, our mobile app, our church mobile app, and on our website. So we have more than one opportunity for you to be able to watch. And those will be archived there on YouTube and on Facebook and on our church app and website for you. You can go back and watch any of the services in the past there. And if you haven't downloaded the church app yet, this is a great time for you to do that. Go to your app store. If you have an uh, Android, you can go to Google Play Store, iPhone, the app store. If you have an Amazon device, you can go and download that there. Uh, Roku, all those things. It's all available at any app store. You can download our church app and follow along with it um, and get connected and stay connected with our church body, even though we can't meet physically. And that's the awesome thing about technology. You know, we, while we can't fill this auditorium like we normally do, we can still stay connected. So what I want you to do this week is I want you to get on the church Facebook page or get on whatever social media that you have and get on there and, and let's get the conversations going. Share pictures. My wife and I were in the car yesterday and um, we, we filmed just a little funny thing where she was uh, taking a poll if you wanted to, if, since we were going to be on lockdown, would you A, rather be locked down with your spouse and your children or B, and as soon as she said B, I yelled out, let her be, um, and just as a joke and having fun and, and playing around. But we want you to do those kind of things. Share them on social media so we can stay connected. I know I miss you guys, and I know many of you have expressed the same that you miss your church family. So let's stay connected. Even though we can't meet face-to-face, -face, we can still have community over these social media opportunities and things that are out there. I promise you this. I'm praying for you. If you have any needs, please email me and let me know. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning in our devotional. Uh, if you're not watching those, they're available every day. They're on the church YouTube page, the Facebook page. I send them out as a notification on the app. So they're there. 
follow along with us. Let's study God's word together and let's continue to grow together. Even though we can't meet face to face, we can still have Christian community together. I want us to pray together and we'll finish our time, but I want you to know that I love you and I miss you guys and I am praying for you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much and thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we know that this is a trying time where there's a lot of fear in our world. People are scared because they don't know what's going on and what's happening and what's going to happen. But we know that you're not the author of fear, that you will give us peace, that you'll give us a sound mind. Help us to lean into that, Lord, and to trust you, to put our faith in you, not just for salvation, but in for our everyday life. So help us in this difficult time to trust you, to use this time where we can share our faith, even on social media and sharing uh, different Bible studies together. And even this message talking about what salvation really is. We can share that with other people and they can hear. And what an opportunity we have to get your word out to people who may never walk in the doors of our church. So help us, even in this time, to be faithful to you. Lord, I pray for protection amongst my brothers and sisters. That you would keep them safe. That you would... Uh, bind and rebuke Satan, that you would place a hedge of protection around them, that you would keep this virus away from them. And then, Lord, if one of them does contract it, Lord, I pray for a speedy, quick recovery, knowing that you are the great physician and that you love us and that you care about us. You are our good, good Father. And Lord, help us to stay connected. Help us to stay in community with each other, to not isolate ourselves so much that, that we lose that sense of connection and family that we have here at Open Door. Help us to stay faithful to that as well. Lord, we love you. We trust you. We put our faith in you to get us through this difficult time. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow in devotions. And if you need anything, email me and let me know. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow.